foundation of their entire game. And if you guys can picture a pyramid, the wider and broader and more sturdy you can make that foundation, then the higher the potential peak, which is why great players and great teams are in great shape. See, if you can get your players just a little bit quicker, a little bit faster, a little bit stronger, a little bit more explosive, if you can improve their spatial awareness and their coordination and their mobility and their reaction and their hand-eye coordination and get them in great basketball shape, then they can perform the skills of the game, shooting, passing, rebounding, defending, and ball handling, they can perform the skills at a much higher level. They can perform their skills with more efficiency and they can perform their skills for longer before fatigue sets in, which again is why great players and great teams are in great shape. Now my number one goal is to redefine how you think of basketball athleticism. Because at least in the states, players and coaches are programmed to think it's simply how fast the player runs or how high a player jumps. Because that's what's sexy, that's what's on Sports Center. But there's so much more to developing a basketball athlete. For example, balance. Every single skill in the game of basketball, every skill, especially the skill of shooting, drastically decreases when a player is off balance. So working on kinesthetic awareness and spatial awareness and getting players to get in, stay in, and move from a position of balance is extremely important. Speed. Basketball is played at a very fast pace, but it is not a speed game. The player that can run 84 feet uninterrupted in the game of basketball is irrelevant. Basketball is about starting and stopping, it's about reacting, it's about accelerating and decelerating. Now I'm a big believer in the brick by brick philosophy. And if you guys look over here at this brick wall, there's something I notice anytime I see a brick wall. Every brick has been laid perfectly. There's not any bricks missing, there's not some sticking out, there's not some of them diagonal. Every brick has been laid perfectly, and thus the end result is a sound, sturdy wall, or in this case, an absolutely gorgeous facility. Well, building a player's athleticism or building their skills is done the same way. We have to make sure that every brick is laid perfect. And every rep of every set, of every workout, of every practice, of every game is another brick. So as far as players are concerned, how they do anything is how they do everything. So we need to make sure right from the beginning that we're laying every brick as perfectly as possible. And the neat part is the stuff I'm going to share with you today can be done with players as young as 8, 9, or 10 years old all the way up through professionals. Certainly you need to modify some things and tweak some things, uh, but it's a very wide range of players that this stuff is applicable for. Now just as a player's uh, athleticism is the foundation of their game, their feet are the foundation of their athleticism. Every single thing a basketball player does starts at their feet. Every pass, every shot, every rebound, every defensive slide starts at their feet. Yet the ankle is the number one injured area on basketball players of every age, of every level, all over the world. So it's safe to say the feet are vaguely important. Well, as a coach, I understand that I get what I emphasize. The guys at the math of the high school that I work for in, in Maryland, they don't know a whole lot, but they know Coach Stein thinks the feet are very important. And the reason they know that is we start every workout uh, barefoot. And I've got a couple of young ladies who are gonna come up now, they have their shoes off. That's your cue. Basketball shoes by design are to create as much stability as possible, which when they're playing is fine, but in order to strengthen the intrinsic muscles in their feet and improve the mobility in their ankles, we take them out of their shoes and certainly take them out of their ankle braces and tape. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But I'm gonna show you a handful of things that we do prior to every workout. Uh, and, and just so you know, my talk has been divided into two hours. I do an hour this morning, I'll do an hour tomorrow. Uh, today's gonna focus on uh, ankle and hip mobility, on a very purposeful warm up and covering strength and power. I highly, highly would hope you come back tomorrow where I'll cover quickness and reaction and conditioning and agility. Uh, but I've really neatly divided the two uh, right down the middle. All right, what the young ladies are gonna do now, I just want you to balance on your right foot and I want you to lift your left knee so it's higher than your hip. Left knee higher than your hip. This is the very first thing we'll have our players do. And I recommend you try this with your players. If your players have difficulty balancing on one foot without their shoes on, that ankle they're standing on, that's a red flag. They're, they're at a higher risk of having an ankle or foot problem with the leg that they're standing on. And it's okay, it's challenging. You'll see immediately how dependent kids are on playing in their shoes. So it's okay if they're having some difficulty. If gravity starts to win and this knee starts to come down, which it is, that just means this young lady might be lacking some core strength, some strength in her hip flexors. Again, that's okay, that's okay. Now before you all laugh too much, you're gonna be up here in a minute too, so <laughs> just be careful, peanut gallery. Now without changing anything else, I want you two to close your eyes. Immediately close them, close them as tight as you can. You'll see when you remove one of the senses, especially the sense of sight, which we're so dependent on, it makes this 10 times harder. 
but we're working on their spatial awareness, their kinesthetic awareness, their balance. There's a big word in the industry called proprioception. Proprioception just basically means you can control your body in space. That's the essence of basketball. They have to have full control over their body at all times. They have to control how fast they go, when they jump, when they cut. About 10 seconds left, ladies. And you see they're struggling a little bit, that's okay. If they do this a couple minutes a day, most days of the week, in two to three weeks, if y'all were to come back, they'd be killing this right now. And relax. All right, now, of course, if we were doing this for real, we would do both legs, because we want to even those legs out. But for clinic purposes, I want to get as much stuff as I can in 55 minutes. So we're not going to do the other leg, we're going to move to the next exercise. If you guys want to switch legs so one leg doesn't get tired, that's cool. So we're gonna, you're gonna balance on your right foot down. I want this foot to stay completely flat. I want you to lower yourself until you can just touch your palms to the ground to stand all the way back up. This foot must stay flat. I don't want your heel coming up. Try not to touch this leg and you're not transferring weight to your hands. You're literally coming down, kissing off the ground and coming right back up. I'd like you to do 10 of them with your eyes open and I'd like you to do five of them with your eyes closed, please. Working on some mobility in the Achilles. Excellent, you guys are doing nice. After you get 10, we'll go five eyes closed. <clears throat> okay, doing fine. You'll probably notice a big difference between the eyes open and eyes closed. They're, they're actually both doing an outstanding job with it. Outstanding. Now to their credit, they're trying to do something that they've never done before. Not only in front of these hyenas over here, but in front of 300 coaches. It's a little bit more pressure than if we're in the privacy of our own gym. Outstanding, ladies. Nice job. I'm not counting, that's up to you guys. That's probably close enough. The next thing we're gonna do, you're cool. We're gonna go to a lunge. I'm gonna talk in a little bit when we talk about a purposeful, uh, purposeful warm up, why the lunge is so important. But I want you to get in a lunge position. Now when we lunge, I don't want your feet on a tightrope. You'll have no balance if your feet are on a straight line. So I want you to stay hip width apart. We'll put one foot out. I want your ankles, knees, hips, and shoulders square to the direction that you're facing. I want your back knee about three to four inches off the ground. I want your front knee above your heel and try to keep your torso upright. Go ahead and just hold that position. Hold that position. And it's gonna burn for a little bit. You're gonna feel a really good stretch in the arch of your back foot. True to form, you're gonna hold for about 30 seconds, then we'll close your eyes for about 30 seconds. If any of you happen to follow me on Twitter, you know that I'm not afraid to put some quotes up. I've always been motivated by quotes. There's one quote that I have never put up and will never put up, and that's no pain, no gain. And the reason I don't put that up is I absolutely, positively, 100% disagree with that philosophy. Pain is your player's body way of telling them that something isn't right, and they would be a fool not to listen to their body. Go ahead and close your eyes, ladies. Everything else stays the same. They'd be a fool not to listen to their body. So pain is bad. If your players are having any pain, a sharp pain, they get down in a lunge and they feel a pain in their knee or their back, they need to stop immediately. However, and this is what makes it a little bit tricky, very close to pain is discomfort. Now discomfort is a good thing. We crave discomfort. Great players have an extremely high tolerance for discomfort. So point being with this young lady right here, if she gets down in this lunge position and feels a sharp pain in her knee, she needs to stop immediately. If she gets down in this lunge position and feels like someone took a match and lit her thighs and her core and her butt on fire, now that's discomfort. That's all part of the experience. We want that. So the more of that she can tolerate, the better. But it's so important as coaches that you open up those lines of communication. See, if a player's having pain and you tell them to tough through it, you might be making something that's a very small issue a very big issue. You're gonna add dysfunction to that player and that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. And again, I can't stress enough that right now we're only doing one leg at a time. Of course, we'd be doing everything on the right and on the left. Uh, next thing, just pick any line. Why don't you use this line? And you can even go sideways and use this line right here. We're going to do some very low-level line jumps, which again, everybody's done before, but it's a little bit different without your shoes on. I want you barely jumping high enough to jump over the line. So we're not being the hero, but I want you to just use one foot. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go a side-to-side -side jump for 10 touches. On the 10th one, I want you to stick and hold for a long three seconds. One two, three. It was almost awkward, right? Three seconds is a lot of time, a lot of time. Don't rush. So go ahead and go back and forth 10 times. On the 10th one, stick that landing and hold for a long, awkward three seconds. Excellent. 
And then do the same thing front to back. So now face your line, same thing front to back. Yep, nice and easy. And the stuff we're doing today, they don't have to do every single workout. We recommend our kids go barefoot two to three minutes a day, most days of the week. Now we're gonna get a twist. So we're gonna actually, you're gonna twist your hips and shoulders, and I want you trying to rotate your foot 180 degrees. Same thing on 10. Now the more you rotate your hips, the more your foot will rotate. And then we'll hold. <laughs> and that's it. And you stick the landing for three seconds, or in your case, 0.5. <laughs> then I want you to get in a good athletic stance and all I want you to do is pull your toes to your nose. Whether you realize it or not, you guys have shin muscles and I want you to activate those right now. So you're just going to pull toes to nose, good pause at the top and back down. Trying to get your feet up as high as you can. Just get 10 of those and then you may put your shoes back on. Let me preface this by saying I am not a doctor. I'm not a physical therapist. I'm not an athletic trainer. I'm simply a strength and conditioning coach, so I would never do anything to undermine one of those medical professionals. However, in my opinion, having been in this, uh, this industry daily for over a decade, if a player has healthy, fully functional feet and ankles, they do not need the external stability of a brace or tape. In fact, in my opinion, that's going in the wrong direction. I believe the ankle joint's arguably the most important joint on a basketball player's body, and by locking them into a brace or tape, you're going to make that joint less mobile, you're gonna make the feet weak. Now, if they've, if they've experienced an ankle in injury and one of the medical professionals tell them to wear a brace or tape as part of the rehab process, that's fine, but if you have fully functional, healthy ankles, it's unnecessary. Hopefully no one in here has ever broken their wrist, but I'm sure you can picture someone who has. I have a, a cast on this wrist, and I take it off 10 to 12 weeks later. What's the difference between this forearm and this forearm? This is the active participation part where somebody yells something out and I don't feel like an idiot standing here. Hey, this one's smaller and weaker, right? Why? Because you haven't been able to use it. See, you either use it or you lose it. Same thing with your heart, same thing with your brain, same thing with the muscles in your body. If you can't use something, you will lose it. So by taking the ankle joint and locking it in the equivalent of a cast, for long periods of time is gonna make that joint less mobile. And that's the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. The kids at the map up, our guys play basketball year round. They play basketball 25 to 30 hours a week, most weeks of the year, and most of our guys have been doing that since they were this big. So if they've been wearing ankle braces, boy, that's a lot of time to have your foot in a cast. So again, all I try to do is stir the pot. I want you guys to be free thinkers uh, because uh, that's one of the things I've actually done a complete 180 on. If you look at any of my material five to six to seven years ago, I was a huge advocate of ankle braces. And now for the reasons I just described, it's the exact opposite. Now what we're gonna do, and, and this will be for anyone that wants to participate. I could use as little as three or four of you, but if all of you wanna go through the warm up, you're more than welcome. I just need you to grab a basketball and without dribbling, I repeat, without dribbling, just line up on that back sideline pretty please. In my opinion, the warm-up is one of the most important aspects of your player development program, yet it's by far the most neglected. If you don't leave with anything else from my talk today, understand this. If you still have... <laughs> hey, Steve Nash, hold on to the ball over here. There we go. Well, there's one at every party, isn't there? And spread out. We need good spacing. To be blunt, the day and age of having your players jog three laps around the gym and then sit on their ass and pretend to stretch at mid-court, those days are over. And, and I mean pretend to stretch. They're not doing anything to physically or mentally get themselves the player to compete at a high level. In order for a warm-up to be effective, it has to have purpose. And in order for it to have purpose, you need to require your players to do in warm-up what you require them to do when they play. There are six movements that every single basketball player goes through when they play, whether you realize it or not. Players have to sprint, players have to backpedal, they have to defensive slide, they have to pivot, they have to jump and therefore land, and they have to lunge. And if you can't picture a lunge, I get the ball and I'm getting ready to go to the basket and they freeze the film, this is the position I'm in. This is the position, I'm, I'm in a lunge. It's kind of an awkward lunge. This foot's internally rotated, most of my weight's going forward, but I'm in a lunge. Players are in a lunge position hundreds of times over the course of practices and games. So we have to make sure they have good balance, they have good strength, and they've got mobility out of a lunge position. So to make sure our warm-up's purposeful, we're gonna go through those six basketball movements as often as we can. Doesn't, excuse me, doesn't mean you have to fit all six in every single warm-up, but we need to make sure over the course of the week that we're ingraining these movement patterns, these muscle patterns, because this is what they need to play. And this is what they need to do to perform their skills at the highest level. 
don't get it twisted. I am humble enough to know that what I do is a small piece of the puzzle. Very small piece of the puzzle. It's an extremely important piece, but it's a small piece. At the end of the day, skill is king. If your players can't shoot, pass, rebound, defend, or handle the ball, they're not very good basketball players. They might just be very fit human beings. So understand that this is just the base layer upon which everything else is built. But just like when you're building a house or building a gym, if you don't have a strong foundation, if they don't have strong movement, they're not going to be able to perform their skills at the highest level. So I'm going to take them through now uh, a, a fairly rapid fire type warm up, which will give you a pretty good example of the things that we'll do at the math level. First thing we'll do, and you can actually just set the balls behind you right now, we'll use them in just a second. We're going to get in an athletic stance. Athletic stance is defined as chest over knees over feet. Players are low enough that they could touch their kneecaps with their fingertips, but we're certainly not going to keep them down here. We keep our hands up and active because nothing can be done in the game with hands in your pockets. So hands are up and active and you're on the power pad of your foot, which is this front part. You're not on your heels, but you're not on your tiptoes. Where can you move from in this position? What direction? Every direction, that's why I want you in this. You can go front, you can go back, you can go diagonal, you can pivot, you can jump, you can dive, you can take a charge, you can do anything from this position, which is why I want you here. Now as I see some of you starting to raise up, this is not a comfortable position to be in, right? This is not natural. You know how I know this is not natural? When I'm done speaking, if they give you guys a five minute break, not one of you is gonna leave like this, right? <laughs> because it's uncomfortable. But if we need players to be in and move from a position that's uncomfortable, we have to condition them mentally and physically to be in it. So we have to make sure that the athletic stance is the basis of everything we do. We're going to get some multi-directional jumps, just nice and easy. You guys are going to jump forward, jump back, jump forward, jump back. I want you to imagine that the floor is hot. Every time you touch the ground, you're immediately into the next jump. So you, in a nice little rhythm, like a cat, jump forward, jump back. When you get rim to rim, you may jog to the other side. Go! Nice and easy. Quick feet. You want to land like a cat, not like a cow. Nice and easy. There we go, ladies. Looking good. When you get rim to rim, jog it out. Nice. Rim to rim, jog it out. Anything athletically that you can do forward, I need you to be able to do backward. Anything you can do to your right, I need you to be able to do to your left. So yes, correct. You're going to jump back, jump forward, jump back, jump forward. When you get rim to rim, backpedal it out. Go! So we're loosening them up from the ankles up, ankles up. Getting our different movement patterns in. Back pedal it out. Let's face in this direction right here. I want you to jump right, jump left, jump right, jump left. When you get rim to rim, defensive slide out. Go. Hands are up and active. Ready for deflections, ready to rebound, ready to catch a pass. Excellent. Same thing coming back, still facing this way. Now the only thing that we're missing right now, and I'm not gonna bust their chops because we're at a clinic and they were nice enough to get up early, but we have a severe lack of enthusiasm. This would be absolutely, absolutely unacceptable if we were at the math. Nice job. Now as you guys will learn over the next 33 minutes that I have a real affinity for little kid games. There's lots of things that, that you probably haven't done for a few years, and Lord knows it's been 25 years since I've done them, but they reinforce the movements that I need. We're gonna play a game of red light, green light. So you're in your athletic stance, when I say green, and we're still warming up, so right now it's okay for you to go at 60 to 70%. Don't anybody try to win a medal, just 60 to 70% is fine. When I say green, I want you to start sprinting towards this sideline. When I say red, I want you to lower your center of gravity, you lower your hips, I want you to take shorter choppier steps, and I want you to freeze in that athletic stance. And I don't want you to move until I say green again. I'm gonna try as hard as I can to trick you. I'm gonna try as hard as I can to get you off balance and do this because you think I'm gonna say it. That's my goal is to try and get you to do that. All you need to do is listen and control your body. Two things that are extremely important to success on the court. Listening and controlling your body. Everybody in an athletic stance? Everyone understand the rules? Red. Exactly. <laughs> One for me? No, I'm just kidding. That just makes me laugh. Green. Red. Green. Red. Green. Red. Green. Hey, give them a hand, by the way. You all up there in the cheap seats. There you go. No, don't go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, no, this show's not over. Never mind. For the rest of the time, do not give them a hand. Jeez. No, you got, we're not done. We're just getting cooking. Now, the same thing we did forward, we have to do backward. But I want to make sure you guys understand from a balance standpoint. If you are leaning forward, which some of you are just doing, what is one direction I know that you physically cannot go? You can't go back. 
they've roughly eliminated a fourth of their options, and as a defender, arguably their most important option. As a defender, my ability to take a retreat step is extremely important. So if I'm leaning forward and my center of gravity is moving in this direction, I'm the easiest player on the floor to beat. A marginal offensive player will go around you with no problem if all of your weight and energy is leaning forward. Okay, red light, green light, now we're backpedaling. Now we're backpedaling. I can't believe you guys were trying to sit down. Oh. Green, red, green, red. slide now. I'm not that old, but even when I was coming up in high school, we were taught to defensive slide. We were taught to step, slide, step, slide. In fact, we spend 30, 40 minutes just doing this over and over. That is an old, ancient, unathletic, archaic way to move. That is not how the body was intended to move. That's relying on the groin muscle of my front leg to pull my hind leg. We don't want that. If you want your players to move better laterally, which is extremely important, power is not just about jumping up. It's also about moving side to side. They need to do what's called a push step. As far as basketball is concerned, the butt is the strongest muscle group in the body. And they need to use that butt as the engine. So if I'm gonna move to my left, instead of stepping and dragging my right, I wanna push from my right. I wanna use this as the engine. That subtle difference is tremendous as far as improving lateral quickness and lateral explosiveness. Now, during warm-up, while we're still building them brick by brick, it's okay if they're consciously aware of that. It's okay if during warm-ups, these young ladies need to say to themselves, push off my left, push off my left, that's okay. The goal is to take something that's conscious and do it enough times that it becomes an unconscious habit. So back at the Mapo on Tuesday and Friday nights when the lights come on and the cheerleaders start dancing, our guys are no longer saying, push off the right, push off the right. It's been, been ingrained, it's now a habit. It's the only way they know how to move. And the only way that can happen is if it's done for thousands and thousands of task specific repetitions through warm up. This is the reason that your warm up needs to be purposeful. There's a bigger picture. So we're facing this way. We go red light, green light. Green means go and it means you're pushing off of your left foot. Drive the, drive the, the left. Use your left butt cheek. Green, red, green, red. Green, red, green, red, green. Fred, outstanding, outstanding. Same thing coming back. Now we're pushing off the right. Tremendous job, ladies. I would have them clap for you, but I'm afraid you guys are going to leave the building. Green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red. Outstanding. Now that they're on this side and they ain't going to go anywhere, you guys can give them a hand, please. You can pick up the ball. You guys are good girls, man. I appreciate you. Don't dribble, though. Pick up your ball. We're going to do a series now where we're going to work on pivoting. Uh, and again, uh, what they're about to do is not necessarily 100% game specific, but it's movement specific. We're priming their ankles, their knees, their hips, and their core for what we'll need them to do. You're going to take a big crossover jump. So if I'm going to go this way, I'm taking a crossover jump, and I'm going to land one, two, just like I would shoot my jump shot. When I land one, two, I'm now going to front pivot on my right foot all the way around. Then I'm going to take a big crossover jump, one, two, and I'm going to pivot all the way around. So live, it's going to be here, jumping, one, two, covering some ground, hard pivot, one, two, hard pivot. So if you need to stagger yourself so you don't run into each other, you got to have good spatial uh, court awareness, communicate. Whenever you're ready, you guys start. Go ahead. Go ahead. Talk to each other. Go ahead. Yes, pivot. Visualize, game specific pivot. Excellent. Excellent. Nice work, ladies. Pivoting, unfortunately, in the game is a dying art. And your, your feet are king. We have to make sure that our footwork is great. We want to reinforce it with everything that we do. Nice job, guys. Really nice job. We're going to do the same thing going back, except this time, instead of a crossover step, we're going to take the equivalent of what you do if you were shooting a step back. If I was shooting a step back on this basket, I wouldn't push myself straight back. I'd come in and I'd push at an angle in order to get my shot off. So we're going to do the same thing here. You're going to push off of your right, explode back diagonal, and this time, instead of a front pivot, we'll reverse pivot which will feel a little bit weird. You would rarely reverse pivot in a full 360, but again, I'm not worried about doing something specific to the game. I'm more worried about the movement. So we're gonna go, why don't everybody go back to this corner first, explode back like you shoot your step up, 
and let's reverse pivot around. You can stagger yourselves again. You guys did an awesome job last time. Whenever you're ready, ladies, you're up. There you go. Excellent. You'll see all of this stuff will challenge their coordination, challenge their kinesthetic awareness. This is great. Excellent. 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 No more dribbling. <laughs> Let me get roughly half of you rim to rim and the other half right here on the volleyball line. Half here and half here. We'll go through a few more things. As far as our warm up and as far as improving mobility in the ankles and hips. I told you, the, so we're gonna face this direction. So half of you are rim to rim facing that way, half of you are on the volleyball line facing that way. Stay, are you, uh, that's fine. Come here, okay. <laughs> Everyone's facing this way. There's some people over here watching you. Let's take a look at them. There you go. If I were to ask most of you to get out of your seat and do a lunge, chances are 99% of you would do this right here. Totally understandable, that's what we all think of when we think of a lunge. But I want to broaden your thinking. There's so many different angles and positions that we can be in a lunge, and we want to make sure that we're challenging our players through all of them. Especially from a standpoint, not just of strength and balance, but for mobility in the hips. So I like to tell players that they're standing inside of a big clock. And we're going to do a set of clock lunges now. So you, you can hold the ball under your chin. This would be 12 o'clock. And then we step out to one o'clock, slightly different angle. Now you get it two. When we step to three o'clock, it's a complete lateral lunge. Tremendous for the groin. Notice that this foot stays flat. I don't let this foot roll over. When I get to four, I can start to open my hips up. Five, same thing. Six, you can either open all the way up or you can step straight back. Once we get to seven and eight, now we're starting to whip behind us a little bit. A step behind lunge. We go eight. Nine is gonna be really difficult. Remember what I said at the beginning about I don't want pain. If anyone were to start stepping to nine o'clock and feel pain, you can either pivot your foot or just skip nine altogether, that's okay. Then we'll go 10, we'll step across, and then we'll go 11, a little bit more of a shallow cut. So we're, right now, each of you, your left foot is your pivot foot, and I want you to go through all 12 numbers on the clock. Take your time, you can keep the ball under your chin for now. Big steps. Make sure that left foot stays flat when we move lateral, that's great, tremendous job, nice work. Nice work. So you just now took one exercise in your toolbox and you multiplied it by 12. Multiplied it by 12. Now the best part is, we haven't done anything regarding the upper body. Right now they're just casually holding the ball under their chin. There's an infinite number of things they can do with their upper body. They could, every time they step, they could reach the ball up. Every time they step, they could twist to the same side. Every time they step, they could reach to the floor. Also understand from a warm-up standpoint, anything your players do as a warm-up, you can find a way to make it progressively more intense. In fact, it'd be part of the workout. Anything you would have your players do as far as a workout's concerned, you can find a way to lessen the intensity, make it part of the warm up. Right now, this was more for their hip mobility, <coughs> excuse me, and working on balance. If I gave this young lady a, a five kilogram ball and we went through two sets and I made her do a reach or a twist, it'd be more of a workout. She'd really start to feel burn in her legs and hips, core and upper body as well. So any of, <coughs> excuse me, any of this stuff, we can tweak. Now. Great that we're working with young ladies. How many of you coach young ladies? Females, females are five to eight times more likely to suffer ACL injuries than males. Some of that is due to some genetic differences we can't do anything about. Large majority of that are due to some factors that are very trainable. But for those of you that coach guys, which is what I do, the math is an all guys school, a la Derek Rose, obviously men aren't immune to ACL injuries either. So this type of stuff can be woven into the fabric of everything that you do. In addition to the six uh, basketball specific movements, you want to do four things if you want to lessen the occurrence of ACL injuries. Remember, we can't prevent any of it. I'm actually embarrassed that I did a DVD five years ago and had the audacity to call it ACL injury prevention. As if Derek Rose would watch my video, he never would have had a knee injury. Just poor terminology. So from this point forward, I'm very careful in choosing my terminology. It's called ACL injury reduction. There's an inherent risk with everything you guys do in life, everything they do as players, but we can do things to drastically decrease that risk. The four things you need to do. First, you need to improve mobility, <coughs> excuse me, in the <coughs> excuse me, in the ankles and hips. 
When a player runs and jumps, they do what's called triple extension. They extended their ankles, they extended their knees, and they extended their hips. If any one of those three joints is not working properly, they're not running as fast or jumping as high as they're capable of. Conversely, when they land, when this young lady lands from a jump, we want, we want the impact to be dissipated through her ankles, through her knees, and through her hips. If her ankle cannot flex because she has immobile ankles or she's wearing very tight, rigid ankle braces, and if her ankle can't flex, all of the impact goes to the next closest usable joint, which is what? The knee. So the knee starts to take the brunt of the force. So just by improving mobility in the ankles and hips, you'll alleviate some of the wear and tear and pounding on the knee. Number two, we need to strengthen the lower body particularly the posterior side, the hamstrings and the butt. That's what we're getting ready to do right now. Number three, you have to have players subconsciously know how to land safely, land quietly, and land on balance, which we reinforce every single day in our warm-up. And then lastly, you have to <coughs> teach players uh, to, to subconsciously decelerate uh, in a safe manner, have good footwork, which we reinforce during red light, green light, and we will do a ton of deceleration work tomorrow if you guys are kind enough to come back. But point number two, strengthen the posterior side of the body. That's what we're gonna do now. Ladies, we're gonna do what's called a ball reach. I'm gonna go profile view, you guys can still face this way. You're gonna balance on your right foot. Ball's underneath your chin. I want you to reach it out in front of you as far as you can. The goal is to get this leg and your back parallel to the ground, reaching that ball out as far as you can, and then bring it right back in. It's gonna look just like this. Oh, maybe not. Here and back. You should feel a really good stretch in your hamstring, your calf, and your Achilles. The higher you can get that back leg, the better. Why don't you just count out 10 of them, ladies? Excellent. That's great. You should feel a really good stretch in your hamstring. <coughs> Doing fine, ladies. This is absolutely one of the best things they can do to strengthen their hamstring. We do this in 99% of all of our workouts at the Matha. Once again, one set of 10 with a regulation basketball, this is as much of a stretch in working mobility and flexibility in the hamstrings as it is for anything. If we were to greatly increase this, if they were to hold a, a four or five kilogram ball or hold a five pound plate, something like that, and we were to do a couple sets, then it would be more a part of, of the strength work that we do. One other thing they'll do, and I'll just demonstrate this one, uh, which is great for the posterior and the hamstring, which will be your second exercise that you can really do anywhere at any time. You can use a chair, you can use the front part of the, the bleachers, you can use a plyo box, you can use a bench in the weight room. Player will lay down, and form a 90 degree angle with their, their legs. They're gonna go ahead and let their head relax. We'll go one leg at a time, it's a little bit more challenging. They're gonna drive their heel into the chair and bridge up. Pause, down nice and slow. Bridge up, all hamstrings and butt. If you can incorporate a couple of sets of the ball reach and a couple of sets of the lying hip raise in, uh, it will have a huge effect on the strength uh, of your player's posterior. Excellent work. Let's grab. All right, you can stay right where you're, actually, just, just stagger yourselves and spread out a little bit more because you're gonna want some room next to each other. We're gonna go to a couple jumps. We're gonna go to a couple jumps now and then we'll get more into the, the strength work of what we're doing as far as lower body and core. On our jumps, we're gonna do what are called pogo jumps. See, everyone talks about in basketball just jumping straight up and straight down. Uh, that's a very narrow viewpoint. Again, I want you guys to broaden your thinking. Basketball, they're jumping in all three planes of motion. They're jumping, uh, rarely are they gonna jump in one spot and always land in the same spot. So we wanna try to make sure that we're prepared uh, from a variety of different angles. I want you to hold the ball underneath your chin. You're going to jump side to side. We're gonna get 10 jumps, but every jump, I want you to cover more ground. So from here, you're gonna go one, two, three, four, five. By the time you get to 10, you're covering as much lateral ground as you're capable of. Whenever you're ready, you go ahead. Start off nice and easy. Excellent. Look at the range of motion that their ankles go through. Again, we're working on that subconscious quiet landing. We'll take about a 15 second break and we'll do the same thing front to back. You'll find front to back will feel a little bit weird because you're not used to jumping backwards. It's a little bit awkward, but that's okay. I want to challenge your central nervous system. I want to challenge your coordination and have you jumping in different angles. Whenever you're ready, let's do the same thing. Yeah, very difficult, very difficult, nice job. Don't you guys move, can you give them a hand please? Alice did some 
twisting action. And this time, let's go ahead and involve our upper body and let's involve the ball. We're going to go from this position here. I want you to jump. When you go up, I want the ball to go up. I want you to turn 180 degrees. As soon as you land, I want you going back in the same direction. I, this is the hardest part. I do not want the ball to drop below your chest. So it's going to look just like this. Here, as soon as we touch, here, back and forth. Nice and soft, nice and quick. Very elastic, very bouncy. Don't let the ball come down. Get 10 of those, five in each direction, whenever you're ready. <coughs> nice. Go for your vertical jump. Jump high. Just 10. And then let's take a couple deep breaths and let's do the same thing on the other side. Go ahead, same thing on the side, just turn the other way. Go. Right to it, right to it, right to it. If I ask the average player, how do you train your core, 95% of them will immediately lay down on their back and they think abs and they start tugging on their neck and doing six inches and crunches and bicycles and anything else that a coach or a PE teacher has taught them on how to torture their abs. Once again, I want you to think with a much broader view. Your core, your player's core is everything above their kneecaps, everything below their armpits. All of this is their core. Yes, their abs are part of that. So are their obliques, so is their low back, so is their hip flexor, so is their groin, so is their butt. So we want to work all of these different areas to effectively work the core. Having good strength uh, and control of your core makes everything you do with your limbs, your arms and legs much easier and much more powerful. So your core is the center of every single thing that you do. So we're going to go through a core series now. Uh, a couple of things we'll do for core. One will be by yourself, one we'll actually use with a partner. Let's go ahead and get in the lunge position because you guys know how much I love a lunge. <coughs> And in order to train the, the core in a very functional way, basketball is played correctly, it's played standing up and it's played on two feet. So more times than not, we wanna train accordingly. Doesn't mean we always do this. We'll do some stuff out of a plank position, out of a push up position, but anytime we can play the game vertically erect, we wanna do that. From this position, ladies, from the waist down, you are a statue. You are not to move from the waist down. You take the ball, you reach it out to the floor, you reach it up to the sky. Out to the floor, up to the sky, get five of those. Really challenge yourself. Try to, to really reach that thing out in front of you as far as you can, but below the waist you are a statue. Legs are gonna burn, I'm gonna tell you ahead of time. Once you're done, just keep the ball under your chin so I know that you're done. Then let's raise the ball straight overhead and let's sway from side to side. <coughs> right now these young ladies are using a regulation basketball. Again, if this was a four or five kilogram ball, it would make this exercise exponentially harder. Exponentially harder. Now let's go from here. Let's go twist like windshield wipers. Legs don't move. Your legs should be on fire right now. They should be shaking a little bit. They shaking a little bit? Yeah. Doing great. No, I'm not calling you out. That's great. That's what we want. Stay down there. We got one more. See the little switcheroo she just pulled? Smart girl. <laughs> now from this position here, I want you to take the ball. I want you to put your hand under it. Reach it out as far as you can here. Reach it out as far as you can here. Back and forth. And then you can hop up. Outstanding work. Outstanding job. Of course, normally we would do both sides, but we're gonna go ahead and move to the next one. We wanna do the same thing out of a lateral lunge position now, because I really wanna strengthen your groin. If you wanna use the other leg, that's cool. I want you to get to a lateral lunge. Now, when we laterally lunge, I want both feet facing forward. The tendency is to let this foot open up. I want this foot to stay flat on the ground, not roll over, and I want this butt cheek as close to the floor as you can get it. Locked and loaded right here. It's an uncomfortable position. We take the ball, we go floor to sky for five, we sway for five, we twist for five, we reach for five. All the while, your lower body does not move. Whenever you're ready, ladies. Tremendous for your groin. You guys are doing a terrific job, ladies. It's okay. That's why you got teammates. They can help you out.
most abused. Here's what happens in gyms all over the world. You have a rule that says if a player misses a layup, they have to do 20 push-ups. I've seen that in countless gyms. Here's the problem. This young lady misses a layup. What if she's not physically strong enough to do 20 perfect push-ups? And there's a good chance she isn't. The only reason I say that without even knowing her, we have all American level players at the map. The guys that have played major, major Division I basketball. When they come to us as 14-year-old freshmen, most of them can't do five perfect push-ups. Most of them can't. So that's why I, I feel pretty comfortable in saying the chances of her being able to do 20 perfect ones right now is probably slim. No offense. If she misses a layup and I have a rule that she needs to do 20 push-ups and she can only do five perfect ones, what happens? She does five good push-ups and 15 horseshit push-ups, right? Ultimately, that's what happens. Chances are she's going to miss several layups over the course of a practice, which means we're doing the opposite of brick by brick. I'm having her go through an incorrect movement pattern. I'm having her do something that she's not physically capable of doing, and I'm ingraining the wrong movement pattern in her. She could be doing hundreds of incorrect push-ups over the course of the practice. That's working in the wrong direction. So if you're going to use that as your metric, just be real careful about how you apply it. Point being, right now I'd like for you to get down in a plank position, which is a push-up position. Your hands are directly under your shoulders, no, but, but from arm straight, arm straight. Uh, no, just like a, like a push-up, like the top of a push-up. Sorry, those are bad directions. And spread your feet so they're the same width as your hands. Yes, and we need her to hold here. If she cannot hold this position for 45 to 60 seconds without her hips drooping down or without sticking her butt in the air, then she has no business even doing push-ups. If she can hold it, she's doing a great job. If she can hold this position for 45 to 50 seconds, then she can graduate to start doing some push-ups. If she can't do quick, you can relax for a second. If she can't do correct push-ups, there'll be ways that we modify it. Two easy modifications. Of course, the meatheads in the math are called them girl push-ups. They're not girl push-ups, they're modified push-ups. Is they go from there from a kneeling position, so they're taking away roughly a third, a third of their body, a third of their body weight, and we can do push-ups here. We can also have them just do the negative portion, which means they're just gonna lower themselves. So from this, I would just want you to lower yourself under control, and then you can climb back up to the top because you might not be strong enough to push to the top. Those are just some ways that we can graduate to it. Point being, the exercise that I'm going to show you right now, younger kids and kids that haven't developed that requisite strength are not going to be ready for this. I just want to share it with you anyway. Young lady, go ahead and get back in your push-up position. And you're going to hold that. You are a statue right now. As your partner, I'm going to push on your hip and your shoulder. I'm going to try and push you laterally. You're not going to let me move you. I'll push you for 15 seconds, and then I'll hold you for 15 seconds. Same thing. Same thing. So why don't you guys all get down in position? Just pick one person. We'll push laterally for 15. You just count it out to yourself, and then push the other way for 15. If you notice your partner starts to shake too much, they start to drop their hips, they start to stick their butt in the air. Just call it, and it's done. Yeah, that's excellent. Excellent. Camera, I'm missing this group right here. That's great. <laughs> Tremendous for developing the core as well as the upper body strength. Really nice work. Really nice work. Yeah, both people need to go. I'll let the next person demonstrate the next exercise. Wow, that's strong. <laughs> oh. Get her a saddle. <laughs> hey, go ahead and hop up. And I will let you demonstrate this today. Terrific. Nice job. You go ahead and pick up the ball. And I want you to get in that strong athletic stance, and I want you to hold the ball directly out in front. Same concept. I love the partner stuff because, one, it's going to force some... some Rotary is going to force communication and get players to work together. This young lady right now is a statue. She is not to move. The only thing she can do is breathe. I don't want anything else. You're going to push down for 10 seconds. Yep, make sure you breathe in those things, John. And then you're going to push laterally for 10 seconds. And then you go to the other side and push for 10 seconds. So the player is going to work for 30 seconds. If this is done correctly, absolutely will tax the core. Tax the core big time. Let's go ahead and do that, ladies. 10 down, 10 right, 10 left. With our partner stuff in the map, it's very important that we get our players to understand this concept. You have to care about the guy next to you. You have to care about getting the player next to you better. See, if you make the players next to you better, the team gets better by default. That's the definition of being selfless. That's what we want our players to be. Which means right now, the only thing in the world this young lady should care about is making her better. That's all she's worried about is making her better. But then the neat part, what I found about great teams, when it's time for them to switch, she will demand that her teammate gives her the same respect, that her teammate gives her the same care. She will demand it. See, the problem is, this, this can end up being a cancer on the team if you have, you know, it happens on every single team, even at Tamatha. If you have a couple of jackasses in your program and you tell kids to partner up, who usually goes together? 
almost like a magnet. The two jackasses end up working together, right? <laughs> There's no quality work getting done when two jackasses start together. And in fact, if it would be these two, which I know that it's not, they will start to drag down the groups. It's absolutely unacceptable. So you need to make sure that you're careful in how you do the pairings to make sure that very quality work is getting done. Now, you guys know how much I love the lunge. Let's give the ball back to the first person. Let's have them excuse me, get down in a lunge position. Ball straight out the front. Same thing. Five seconds down, five seconds right, five seconds left, then switch legs and do the same thing. You guys are doing an outstanding. <laughs> Perfect one, just a tremendous job. Okay. This, this is when we want to promote coaches on the floor. Yes. So if you were to notice that her back knee's rising up, I want you to tell her to put that down. There you go. <laughs> then we've got coaches on the floor, which is ultimately what we want. We want all of our players to be an extension of us as a staff. Yep, both sides. Get the ball to the other person. Go ahead, get down and put the ball directly overhead. Now this time, then, we can do something similar or we can change the game. Instead of applying steady tension, we can actually, so you're going to stay here frozen right now, facing forward. And I'm just going to kind of tap the ball. You don't let it move. Just, yep, there you go. Stay strong. Stay strong. Just tap the ball all around. That's a nice job. Go for about 15 seconds on one leg, 15 seconds on the other leg. With every single exercise you guys have, every drill, every tool in your toolbox, it's important that you can modify it so the kids eight, nine, ten years old or kids that are lacking certain fundamental movement skills can do that same drill, but you can also tweak it to make it more challenging. And if you happen to be working with elite level university players or even pro players, then you can tweak it for them as well. So we talked about from a push-up standpoint, the continuum of a push-up, first is just the whole plank position. Then we can go to a kneeling position, then we can go to a negative only position, then we can do the smaller chunks of regular push-up. If she can only do three perfect push-ups, that's okay. Maybe we'll have her do five sets of three until she builds up the, the, the strength in order to handle more than that. Then there's ways to make it even more challenging. You guys may all have to see how this is going for Grab the ball. Can you guys give them a hand? They were out there. Yes, that's the piece that ties everything together. 
I'm not a big cosmic thinker. I don't believe in that secret. But if there's anything that you need to unlock your player's potential from an athletic standpoint or a basketball standpoint, it's the concept of being able to play present. Now, play present means three things. And this, you can get your kids to understand this. This is absolutely the hardest thing I've ever come across in coaching for myself and for my players. The first is you have to teach your players how to focus on the next play. The next play is the only play that matters because it's the only play they can still affect. They or you cannot do anything about the past. Here is very typical of youth basketball all over the world. These two young ladies are on a two-on-one fast break. One of them makes a sloppy pass, the other team gets the ball. She spends the next 20 seconds pissed off because her friend ruined her assist. She spends the next 20 seconds pissed off or embarrassed because she missed the ball. Chances are, you guys are on the sidelines stopping like a madman or a mad woman because that's an easy two points you could have gotten. If you're playing the Mountain Catholic High School and two of your players on the floor are not present for 20 seconds, you know what happens? Yeah, we score. Chances are very high, we knock the ball too. And in fairness, if we're not present, the same thing happens to us. So you have to make sure the players have an extremely, extremely short-term memory. Now that is not for you to condone bad passes, turnovers, or poor shots, anything but. But it's okay that if a player makes a mistake, that they wipe that slate clean immediately. I see coaches all of the time call a timeout, out of motion, the player makes a bonehead mistake, you call timeout, you bring them over to the sideline, and you spend the next 90 seconds berating that player and rehashing something that can't be changed. We need to make sure that we're doing things to make players prepared to make the next play. Next, you have to teach your player and then teach yourself to focus on the only two things in this world that you have 100% control over. And those things are your attitude and your effort. Sounds really obvious, it's just not practiced very often. Attitude and effort. See, players have, well, here's what happens with most players. They're worried about what their teammates are doing. They're worried about what the other team's doing. They're worried about what you as the coach is thinking they're doing. They're worried about who's the stands, whether it's mom and dad, or boyfriend or girlfriend, or a college recruiter, or university recruiter. They're worried about that. They're worried about the referee. How many of you basketball players spend their time talking to the referee about hand checks or getting fouled? They're focused on things that they have zero percent control over. Zero. Instead of putting all of their focus on the two things they have 100 percent control over. If you can make that mind shift with your players, it is a game changer. And lastly, to tie in the brick by brick philosophy, is you have to make sure your players learn how to focus on the process. All they need to do is focus on the process of what's necessary in order for them to be successful. They don't need to worry about the huge picture. They need to focus on the process of what they need to do. We have a big player, a big guy in our school. He's a senior, kid named BJ. Uh, McDonald's All-American level player. BJ's a large young man. He's 6'8". He hates when I say this. He's a couple sandwiches away from 300 pounds. He's a giant young man. He is a human freight train. As our five man, BJ has one job and one job only when we get possession of the basketball. He is to run from that rim to that rim like the police is chasing. He is to run from that rim to that rim like there's a dog out there. That's the process that he needs to focus on. When, at 6'8", 300 pounds and athletic, he runs from that rim to that rim as fast as he's capable of, 90% of the time he gets the ball, 90% of the time he scores. Here's the problem. He only does that about 20% of the time. <laughs> the other time he's not focused on the process, he's worried about something else. Because I know what goes through his mind because I've talked to him. Here's what goes through his mind. Shoot, I ain't going to run hard this time. Last time I ran hard, James just jacked up a three. I didn't get the bar. I ran hard this time. Now hard it is to run me 300 pounds. That's what goes through his mind. When you're 300 pounds, that means you slide down the court. You know how many times you get the ball? Zero. Even Michael Jordan, the greatest player to ever play the game, if he scored, he did not have the ball. It's impossible. So if BJ doesn't have the ball, he cannot score. When BJ doesn't score, BJ's not very happy. He gets poopy pants really, really quick. We gotta figure out a way to get him focused back in the process. But when he doesn't understand, he would just run from there to there as fast as he can. He'd score 30 to 40 points a game. There's not a player in high school basketball that can stop a 6 8 <laughs> but he loses focus of the process. So if you can get your players to play present, you can get them to focus on the next play, focus on the two things they control, and focus on the process. If you have an av a team of average athleticism and average basketball skills, they will overachieve and they will beat players and teams that are physically superior to them. I can promise you that. If you have a team that is very athletic and very skilled and you can get them to play present, they win championships. That's what the best teams are made of. So I'll leave you with that concept of play present. I really and truly appreciate your guys' time this morning. And just in case you're not coming back tomorrow, let me leave my contact information. I have a 100% return rate on email. I don't mess around with 99%. That's way too hard to even calculate. I figure if you email me, I'll email you back. That's the deal. It's Alan, A-L-A-N, at 
StrongerTeam.com. I'm really big into social media for a variety of reasons. One, it's a great way to share information and connect coaches, but it's a great way to learn. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, you're on YouTube, I use those two ways to disseminate information. If I could ever help any of you, it would be my honor to do it. If you were to ever find yourself on the other side of the pond, going over to uh, near Washington, D.C., if you ever want to see anything we do at the map, you're always welcome to come. Just drop me an email. You can watch anything that we do. We have a very open door policy. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you all tomorrow for the quickness and reaction and agility. And lastly, just give these young ladies one more hand.